How are we today? We're here, I see some costumes, that's wonderful, that's exciting. We're all here to do something together, right? And that's the monster panel. This is one of my favorite things of the year. We get to hear from different professors on their um, takes on Halloween. One of our favorite things is seeing all these costumes around masks and vampires and things of that nature. One of those things that have kind of run rampant throughout Halloween is the new onslaught of the monster slut. Now, we have Professor um, Mariana Garen Navarro to, yes, please, give it up. Here to give a little presentation on slutty costumes for girls. Hi, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Um, can, can you hear me? I don't know if the microphone is working. Yay? Alrighty, so hi, my name is Maria Aguirre Navarro, exactly what he said. Um, I'm a sociology <laughs> professor, and today um, I would like you to, I would like to talk to you about a Halloween or a holiday that is super, super fascinating for sociologists. This is obviously Halloween. Um, why is it fascinating? Because obviously people dress up, but by dressing up, they take on another persona and they engage in a ritual, and ritual or ritualistic behaviors um, are definitely of interest to sociologists. So um, through studying Halloween, we can find out a lot about a person that has decided to wear a specific costume, but also we can learn a lot about society as a whole, as, 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 um, as a living organism, so to speak, right? So um, there's no doubt that Halloween costumes are gender specific, right? Um, there's a section for boys, there's a section for girls, section for men, section for women. So we're going to take a closer look at, uh, at the both sections, actually no, at one section, at um, the section for women and see what exactly is happening in, in the um, section or costumes that are typically geared for women. In other words, we're going to try to answer the question... too sexy or not too sexy, right? This is something that um, we have to answer any day now. Um, all right, so we all can see that there are specific, we all know, I'm not gonna tell you anything new when I say that there are specific costumes for men, specific costumes for women, but we gotta take a step back and see where exactly does it start. So obviously, obviously it starts with kids, right? Um, boys are being taught that there is a specific idea of masculinity that they need to fulfill. They can dress up either funny, right, or as a badass. Right? Usually boys these days go as, as badasses, as you can see here, a soldier, right, uh, or, or a firefighter. But girls are, um, are taught this idea of femininity as being cute and sexy, right? So you have your princesses, you have your angels, you have even a bride. Something that I found really fascinating when I was doing research for this presentation was that, yes, you can definitely buy a bride costume for your daughter, but you cannot buy a groom costume for your son, right? So there you go. It says something about our society and the message that we send to, to children from, from very early ages. <clears throat> Um, Toys R Us uh, website, I analyze the costumes that are occupational costumes. So basically costumes that talk about, or, or you can dress up as a particular occupation, such as soldier, such as, um, such as the firefighter. Um, and it turns out that there is about two to one ratio of boys' costumes that are centered ag uh, around the occupations to girls' costumes that are centered around occupations. So again, here's another message that boys need to go to work. Girls, when they go to work, which is obviously according to the costumes, half the times less possible, right, or encouraged, when they do go to work, they go to work wearing mini skirts and fishnets, <laughs> right? Um, so there you go, yet another, another message that we're sending to, to kids with this. Good news, however, is that these days um, you can actually buy 
costumes for, for girls that are uh, portraying the typical manly professions, such as police officer, right? But let's take a look at how those costumes for girls look. There you go. So you got those uh, knee-high boots. You got automatically the sexy version of a cop. Well, a guy can simply be a cop. A girl, I'm not even talking about a woman, a girl automatically has to dress up as a sexy cop. Um, so when you take a look at the adult costumes, you can clearly see that um, the adult versions are the grown-up, over-sexualized or hyper-sexualized versions of the little girl's costumes, right? All right, let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, I was wondering if we can, if I was able to find something typically, um, typical male uh, occupation such as astro astronaut. There you go. I did see uh, costumes for astronauts, but the problem is, as you can see, that even that little girl, um, the, the costume for the boy is loose and more um, depicted uh, uh, how it actually looks like, while girls' costumes are automatically tighter, body fitting, and um, slightly sexy right there. When it comes for women, definitely sexy off the bat. These days, again, also good news on one hand, because girls are encouraged or can dress up as Star Wars characters, which is great, only if they are sexy. <laughs> All right? Sexy Star Wars characters. That's definitely acceptable. So let's keep going. Let's take a look. So let's apply a couple of sociological theories, a couple of sociological paradigms or, or perspectives to see what exactly happens to us um, when we are dressing our girls and we are dressing ourselves as women in those um, overly hypersexualized costumes. I'm going to present you with both sides of, of, of this coin, meaning I'm going to start by basically saying what bad things or what bad influence does it um, do to us as a society? And then I'm going to follow up to kind of a, uh, with, a, with a devil's advocate um, um, arguments and, um, and maybe defend Slatowin a little bit. So let's take a look. First, we need, to, um, we need to consider socialization. So socialization is a process during which we learn our roles. Roles meaning behaviors that are ex expected of us as um, members of society. Um, then a very important part of socialization is the gender socialization. Well, gender socialization, where we're being taught what is expected of us as males and females. And it starts obviously very early uh, in our lives. It starts whenever we are children. Gender is our master status. Master status meaning the imp one of the most important positions that we occupy in life. When somebody sees you, the first thing they see about you is obviously your sex and your race, right? This is something that, um, that is the most noticeable when you meet somebody. Um, so learning about your sex, learning about your gender, and learning what are the expectations of your sex uh, is super important part of gender socialization. This is also being done, obviously, by costumes. When you are uh, modeling um, certain expectations of you as a mother, expectations of you as a father through uh, costumes, then you're telling your children what is expected of them depending on their sex, depending on their gender. If you, as a mother, uh, de decide to depict femininity as this sexy, dirty, slutty thing, then obviously you're running a risk that this is how your daughter is going to understand their, her, set, her own femininity. Girls' costumes have to be sexy and cute. No, they don't have to. They are sexy and cute because this is what our society expects of women. This is what our society expects of girls. And later on, what happens is that girls internalize that in order to feel sexy, you need to look sexy, right? 
The problem with this is that when you look at the internalized sexualization scale, you will see that there is a negative correlation between the ISS, the internalized sexualization scale, and uh, grades in three core subjects in, um, in statewide tests. I see my students here. I could ask them, what, is, what does it mean? Negative correlation? Anybody want to help me? Or am I putting you on the spot? Negative correlation, meaning that if the, 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 the higher the level of ISS, what happens with the grades, guys? lower the grades, right? So the more sexualized the girls are, the school age girls, the more they internalize that need to, to express their femininity through sexiness or sluttiness, the lower their grades are. So this is definitely a set part. Um, and then another thing that is not new to us as researchers, and you have probably heard of it um, as well, meaning that um, identifying with, uh, with the media uh, personas uh, uh, that have those unattainable, um, unattainable body shapes and unattainable sexualized uh, identities leads, to, unfortunately, to lower self-esteem, body shame, and eating disorders. So there you go, couple of, um, couple of arguments against, uh, against um, uh, those sexualized costumes for girls and women. Another element would be the emergence of the self. Emergence of the self is very important, or is um, socialization is heavily centered around the idea or the process of the emergence of the self. What does it mean, the emergence of the self? Well, none of us is born with understanding that we or I am separate from the world, that I am me, which means different than other people, that I have my own needs different from other people. This is a complicated process, and there are several theories that try to explain how exactly do we develop the idea of uh, being different from the rest of the wor world, yet being part of the social world. If you guys study psychology, you're probably familiar with Freud and his idea of personality, the id, ego, and superego. Well, in sociology, um, we reject, not necessarily completely reject, but we build upon this idea and add so-called social self, meaning that you must develop the idea of who you are through interaction with other people. Without interacting with other people, it is impossible to distinguish yourself from the social world and understand who you are. One of the theories that I would like to present to you guys in, in this theme of Halloween costumes is um, George Herbert Mead's theory of generalized other. Um, in order for us to understand ourselves as individuals, we need to be able to put put ourselves in other people's shoes. We need to understand what are other people's needs, expectations of us, how, would, how their situation differs from our situation. By means of example, if you, blind, or if you ask an eight-year-old and a 14-year-old to explain a board game to people who are blinded versus people who can actually see the game, obviously the 14-year-old is going to give more detailed information, more detailed explanation to somebody who's blindfolded. An eight-year-old, however, will give the same information, the same explanation to both a person who's blindfolded and a person who can see that board game. In other words, an eight-year-old is in incapable at this stage of development to put himself or herself in the shoes of the person that they are interacting with, right? How do we develop this idea? How do we how do we lead to the emergence of the self? Well, according to, to Mead, we do it through three stages. Stage one, up to um, three, three years, um, is that we imitate so-called significant others. So we imitate 
mom, dad, everything that they do, that's the stage when you realize around age two that you have to be very careful what you say and what you do around your kids because you're running the risk <laughs> of them engaging in exactly the same behavior that you don't necessarily want to model for them. So um, after the age three, the next stage is called play. Play is when you start dressing up. And this is when this whole dressing up in Halloween costumes that are sexy or cute for girls sends a very important yet somewhat dangerous message. Because again, we're talking about telling our girls that what is expected of them or who they are, who they are ju judged based on is um, their level of sexiness, their level of cuteness, right? So we're teaching the girls um, to define themselves in this play stage as the, as the desire of other people, the object of desire of the generalized other, right? Another element that of, of me theory that I wanted to bring up to you is the development of I and self, or the difference between I and self, which are both elements, both um, important elements of the self. I, however, is this uncivilized, so to speak, or um, unsocialized, better yet, unsocialized infant that only can react automatically to what other people are doing around him or her. However, later on, through interaction with other people, we are developing so-called me. So how other people perceive us and how does this influence who we are and how we act in life? And whenever we're dressing up as girls, um, as cute and sexy, and we're getting praised for it, then automatically, again, we're er internalizing this and learning that we can only feel sexy, we can only feel cute if somebody tells us that we are cute, that we are sexy, and we're dressing up for somebody else. What does this lead to? It leads to, um, as the research shows, the majority of teenagers these days, when asked a question, what makes you feel sexy, they can't answer, they don't know. Or when they do give an answer, they they're in fact answering a question, what makes you look sexy, not feel sexy. So in other words, girls these days, teenage teenagers these days, um, can only feel sexy if they are told that they look sexy. Let's take a look also at the lolitalization. <laughs> I guess I made up this word right now. Um, so the girls, or the women here, I'm sorry, the women here are glorifying youth. Right? One is dressed up as a schoolgirl, baby panda, and a um, Mickey Mouse, right? Yeah, that's a Mickey Mouse. So obviously, this is again sending a message that young is sexy. Once you pass a certain age, all right, sorry, you can try to dumb yourself down. You can try to wear a costume that maybe will lower your age for that one day. But, um, but in general, youth is sexy, youth is beautiful and hot. All right, this being said, I want to move on to embracing Slatoween a little bit, maybe. <laughs> so this line, the Halloween is uh, the one night a year when a girl can dress like a total slut and none of the other girls can say a word about it. Yes, absolutely. This is a quote from, um, from Mean Girls produced by Tina Fey, right? If you guys have not seen it, you need to watch this movie. Um, <laughs> because, um, because it talks about something that is very important, and that is slut shaming, right? Slut shaming is, um, is one of the things that the third wave feminism is definitely against, or is fighting against, because slut shaming is criticizing a woman for her real or presumed sexual activity, or behaving in a real or presumed um, way that is that is that makes her sexy right um this puts 
this puts a lot of pressure on us as women, right? To be sexy, to to take care of our bodies, to meet that ideal um, body image, but God forbid we actually flaunt those body bodies that we work so hard on. Because automatically, if you're sexy, you gotta be dumb, right? If you're cute, if you're showing off your body, you're a dummy, you're a slut. Uh, should I keep going? Skanky, <laughs> easy, unacceptable, right? And what's more, if anything bad happens to you, you are asking for it because obviously you're flaunting your sexuality, hence you deserve to be raped. Um, women are berated for being sexy, for acting sexy, and also, unfortunately, women, women berate themselves and don't allow themselves to express their sexuality. Um, we are worried that we're not, being, we're not going to be respected if we flaunt our sexuality, hence, Halloween is this wonderful, in sociology we call it the moral holiday, where you can actually be a slut, or look like a slut, and uh, not be judged for it. Okay, I'm wrapping it up, I'm wrapping it up. Alrighty, um, for a lot of women, um, acting sexy or dressing sexy is a mark of independence, security, and confidence. Um, however, we are put, in, put through a process of body shaming, right? So if you do not meet a certain criteria, it's not necessarily about looking sexy, but looking a particular kind of sexy. A couple of years ago, uh, on the Walmart's website, there was a section for Halloween costumes that were called fat girl costumes. They took it off, obviously they said, I'm sorry, it was just a prank, it was just some stupid employees, but it shows something about our society. It's not about how sexy you're dressing, it's just if you meet the criteria of being sexy. So if you're above size 12, uh-uh, no sexy for you, no flirty for you, no fun for you. Um, when you look at the sentence right, right here, this is gonna be the last one. Um, it's a night, even a nice girl dresses like a dominatrix and still holds her head up the next morning. Well, there are a lot of problems with this sentence, if you ask me, because first of all, <coughs> who qualifies as a nice girl, right? Um, if I dress up sexy, does it mean that I'm not nice automatically? Two, why the hell do we refer to grown women as girls? Three, what is dirty or bad about women's sexuality? Automatically, if I'm embracing my sexuality, it's something bad, there's something wrong about me, and I'm sleeping around. So we need to stop dividing naughty and nice, because if we keep doing this, we're going to constantly have that taboo about female sexuality that equals sluttiness. So um, it's up to you guys if you want to embrace Halloween and be called. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or make a different choice. All right, thank you very much, guys. Great. Thank you so much. Does anyone have a couple of quick questions before we move on? We are running a little late, so we're going to have to move quick. Mean Girls. Mean Girls, yeah. She asked what the name of the movie was. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh. um, so I actually had a conversation today with one of my friends. She's a nurse, and um, she completely goes against the dressing as like a kind of slutty, hot nurse thing because she finds it offensive. So do you think other people might find um, dressing as like a like an occupation as slutty, like do you think they might find it offensive or? I th yeah, you should have to stop. I think that these days, whatever you do, there is somebody who will find it offensive. I don't, I don't, was it just um, so yes, to answer your question, like absolutely. Mm -hmm. I yeah. So by not participating in the slutting dressing up throughout Halloween, is that how we can counter act and counter dick this already social stratification crap that we already have going on? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. The, the things that we have to enjoy and engage in a social movement 
although, you know, everything starts with just one person, um, yeah, absolutely, we can, we can change anything. All right, thank you very much, guys. Do you want it up there now? Okay, thank you so much. Now, if you can please welcome English professor Hugh Frazier to talk to you about Vampire's Rule. Ooh. I just uh, talked to the Count a little while ago, and these are his exact words. Here's what he told me. I love a sexy woman. <laughs> All my girls flunked out of high school. <laughs> Vampires have um, been around for a long, long time. And w one of the reasons this uh, mythology persists is preci precisely because of the history. So if we go to Germany, Old Rome, Old Rome uh, Egypt, and China, there are all vampire legends back there. Um, their myths, their folklore, all kinds of different little histories and stories, and these have been carried forward from civilization to civilization. Um, it got so bad in, in Europe in the, between like 1672 and eight, 1750, there was literally vampire hysteria, okay? And, um, what triggered off vampire hysteria were things like this. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to ask a question. How many people in here have tattoos? Okay. It's a good thing you're living in 2016 because if you were living in 1700 Middle Europe, you would all be burned at the stake or you would all be killed for being someone with a strange marking. So if people with strange markings were, cons were likely candidates for vamp to be a vampire. People that died of tuberculosis, which was a disease nobody understood, uh, where you got sicker and sicker and paler and paler and weaker and weaker until you finally died, those people were all thought to be uh, bitten by a vampire. That was the scientific ec medical explanation for tuberculosis in the 1700s. It was you were bitten by a vampire. Um, religion was a big, uh, played a big role in the promoting of vampires because religion was always looking for the devil everywhere, right? And of course, Dracul, Dracula means the devil. And so uh, they would send priests out into uh, the forests, into the cities, looking for vampires. And when they went out into the city, they had what they called a vampire kit, okay? And this vampire kit consisted of various things. First of all, it consisted of a rope in case you needed to get yourself out of a situation. It consisted of a mallet, okay, and a stake for driving the stake into the vampire's heart. It consisted of holy water because holy water would keep you safe from the vampire, or it consisted of the Eucharist or the host, which you would also use to scare the vampire away. This was serious business, folks. People had kits called vampire kits. They gave them to priests, and the priests went out into the forests and into the cities looking for vampires. Now, you probably say, nah, that's ridiculous. We don't believe that stuff now. Well, we still do, as a matter of fact. If you go to Middle Europe now, it's not uncommon to see a burial in a graveyard and that corpse is put down only six inches below the surface. Then everybody retires to the church and then three, usually three men, go back to the grave, dig up the corpse, cut its head off, and bury it six feet down, believing, believing if, if, if this is the case, if the person had a certain marking or a certain disease or something, they, they had been attacked by a vampire. And there's actually pictures of us as early as the 1970s of this happening. So this vampire myth is very, very solid, very, very 
believable by the people in Middle Europe. Now, there was vampire hysteria in Russia also. This went on for decades and decades where people were seeing vampires everywhere. Now, you can imagine this happening and then a writer of fiction getting hold of this and saying, wow, do I have a story or what? So along came some writers. Uh, the first uh, vampire story was published in England in 1819 called The Vampire. Um, but in 1897, the seminal, the most important work on vampires was published. And it was a Victorian novel called Dracula by Bram Stoker. And everything that we believe about vampires, the foundation for that was laid in this book, this Victorian novel. Bram Stoker had a great line, the dead travel fast. That was his idea of how quickly a vampire could move throughout the communities and could move throughout, uh, you know, forests, open territories, whatever. Uh, I might also add that the vampire legend is so popular that the hotel that Jonathan Harker, who's one of the main characters in this book, stayed at in the novel, uh, of course, it didn't exist, right? It was made up by the author. But the people in Transylvania said, aha, Anaheim's got Disneyland, but we got Dracula. So what we're going to do is we're going to build that hotel. So they build the hotel, and they name it after the hotel in the book, and tea, we got to serve something, so they serve plum wine, and that's like blood. So, so they have different things that they offer to the tourists, and of course the tourists love it. They love to go there, and in fact, there was a rumor, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, there was a rumor in Transylvania they were trying to build a kind of vampire Disneyland to, to attract all the, the people to come there because of the folklore and the tradition and so forth. Um, th this is a Victorian novel, and one of the reasons it's so popular is because while, while there's no open sexuality in the book, the whole book is steeped in sexuality because of the bite from the vampire and the women's, you know, succumbing to the vampire's bite and so forth. So in Victorian England, where things were, you know, kept on a QT as far as sexuality, this book became unbelievably popular. And, it, and uh, has anybody read this book by any chance? A couple people. This is a scary book. This is a scary book. You know, and why it's scary, it's written in a, what they call epistolary form. Epistolary form is where you write a series of letters. And, 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 and they record these letters from doctors and different uh, people in the book. And that, therefore, that heightens the terror and, and, and the horror of the book, because when people write about it, they're writing from their own point of view, okay? And they can really put a lot of emotion into it. In uh, 1931, Dr uh, Universal Studios made uh, Dracula, okay? And I'll uh, tell you a little story. And my, m I lived in Burbank, and my father was an animator at Walt Disney. And just up the street in Burbank, five doors up, was the guy from Universal Studios that made all the masks and monsters for those movies. And every day when I'd go to school, I'd go down the street, Niagara Street, and I'd look into his garage, and there were two Tyrannosaurus Rexes standing in his garage. <laughs> and he had so many things to play with, it was incredible. So one day, uh, I got a couple of friends of mine together, and we got a coffin. And then we got this big knife that was this big with a plate. Okay, I put the plate on my chest with the knife sticking out, and then my friends took me around the neighborhood, of course, to show me to the girls and say, this guy's dead. Look at him. But the, the guy uh, was incredible. He had more stuff in there, more masks, more monster masks and everything you could ever imagine at. Um, when the movie Dracula was made, a lot of letters poured into Universal Studios, tons of letters. Guess who the letters are coming from? They're coming from priests. Like, hey, does a vampire really exist? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, students. 
people like yourself, interested. Vampires, really? But 91% of the letters were from who? Women. Women. 91% of the letters to Universal Studios were from women about the story. Now, there's a Dracula comic book up there, Marvel comic book. But in 1954, people became so scared of vampires, they banned them from comic books. They wouldn't allow them. Then, about 12 years later, Hollywood says, you know, we got to make some bucks. So they made Dark Shadows, uh, a soap opera about vampires, one of the most popular soap operas ever. Then Marvel comic books, four, five years later, said, wait a minute. We, we're going to start publishing vampire books. So they quit the ban on vampires and started publishing Dracula in a comic book. This particular comic book is from an entire anthology of comic books on Dracula. They're, they're fantastic. The, the art in these things is unbelievable. You can tell just from looking at it how these artists were, these graphic designers and stuff. They were phenomenal. Now, in 1972, they kept advertising this. I remember seeing this. They kept advertising this movie on TV about a vampire. And it was really unreal. It was very realistic. And it was not a joke. This was played totally seriously. And they kept you know, advertising. They were running trailers of this movie. And it was called The Night Stalker. And they kept running these trailers for about two weeks. And then all of a sudden, the movie hit TV a bigger audience than the Super Bowl. That's how big this movie was. It was monstrous. And then at that time, Hollywood knew they had just hit the mother load. They had hit the golden vein of wherever where the gold is. And that's when, from that date on, you saw a complete uptick in not only just monster movies, but Dracula movies and vampire movies. And that, that movie, the Night Stalker still is a good movie to watch. There was a hell of a scene in that movie. It was, took place in Vegas, of course, because that's where all the women are wandering around on the streets. And uh, it's, they're easy prey to the vampires. They had this one scene in the movie that was fantastic. This, they, they showed this uh, night, you know, this girl, woman who worked in a casino, and she got off work. It was probably midnight. And she was walking down the streets of Vegas, and then she turned up an alley. And of course, everybody's saying, oh, wait, I mean, you can't go down that alley. But she goes down that alley, and then she turns and goes to her car, and she looks back. You don't see the vampire, but you see his back. And you hear a little hiss. And she's really confident. No problem. She opens her door, and a Doberman pincher pops out of her car and jumps onto the vampire, and the vampire breaks its, breaks its neck in one second. I mean, that was an incredible scene, you know, for a movie in 1972. Uh, very good movie. I, I strongly recommend you see it if you like vampire movies. It's really, really great. Then Coppola, 1992's Dracula movie, and a 1994 interview with a vampire was a novel, and then vampires took off. But let me just say a few things really quickly. What are the vampire? Now, everything I'm going to read here is from, from this book. This book is the Bible. And if you, you, if you don't think vampires are written about, how about this one? The Encyclopedia of, of a Vampire, 900 pages <laughs> right here. Okay, so... What do we got? Vampires are cunning. They can move air, earth, fire, and water. That's their ability. They command the meaner things. Moths, bats, foxes, wolves, rats, and owls. They can vanish and grow small. Uh, they're 20 man strong. Uh, Stoker was emphatic about that. He had the strength of 20 men. He can be a mist. He can become a wolf. Yeah, if you're bitten by a wolf, you're in big trouble because you're, you're likely to turn into a vampire. Uh, they can go on forever. They live forever. Why do they live forever? Because Stoker was real smart. He took a quote out of the Bible that said, for the blood is the life. And so then Stoker got this idea. Wow, if he can suck blood out of people, he can live forever. So that's the connection with the Bible. So there was a biblical reference within, within this Dracula novel. Uh, you can see in the dark, 
uh, and he draws his strength from his native soul, soil. So you remember the scenes where he brings all his, all his coffins from Transylvania to England, and all the coffins are full of his native soil, so he can sleep in his native soil. These are fantastic ideas by a novelist. You, you leave it to a fiction writer to come up with this stuff. I mean, this is unbelievable, coming up with all these little things like that. Um, the, they, they, if you hold a mirror, you've seen this in the movies where they hold a mirror up to a vampire and he goes <laughs> like that. That's because he can't see himself in the mirror. He bears no reflection. Now, this is how smart Stoker was. A mirror is a symbol of soul. Okay, soul reflects all things perfectly. And so by him unable to see himself in the mirror means what? Dracula has no soul. That's, that's the connection there. Um, when, of course, they had to change a few things. So he, his powers are all at night and none of them are in the day. But of course, that's changed now. We got vampires running around in the day, midday, late night. It makes no difference nowadays. They've, they've you know, exploded the mythology into all different kinds of things. But originally, no way. The vampire never functioned in the daytime. Um, they travel on the rays of the moon. Uh, they don't drink wine, though. Make a big point of that, that vampires don't drink wine. Um, now we need an adversary, right? We need somebody to fight the vampire. So, so Bram Stoker came up with this guy, Dr. Abraham Van Helsing. And they've already made a couple movies. Now there's a TV drama that looks more like a, a zombie movie, but it's, it's called Van Helsing. You can catch it on the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, He's not a normal doctor. He deals in things supernatural, abnormal. He's a psychic. He's beyond normal medicine. Absolutely. This is the type of guy you have to have. You can't have a normal doctor fighting a vampire. Are you kidding me? You've got to have somebody that's, that's totally different with kind of supernatural powers. And it, during the time that uh, Dracula was written, hypnotism was a big deal. So, of course, this guy could use hypnotism to hypnotize one of the women in the novel to see where... Dracula was, so they could find him. Um, things that bother the vampire. Garlic. That, so that's why you go in Middle Europe and you see houses out there with little garlic hanging on them. Yeah, get rid of the vampire. Uh, crucifixes. Uh, of course, today the vampire, crucifix doesn't, he's not afraid of vampire. I mean, crucifixes now don't scare vampires, but they did back in Victorian England. Uh, sacred bullet. Silver bullet. Um, a host or running water, those kind of things bother the vampire. So again, Stoker made clear in his novel that these are the things that you could combat the vampire with. So he set the stage for everything that has to do with vampires. Um, finally, just a, a co vamp I, I give credit to that movie, the, the movie where they set the Night Stalker movie in Vegas. I mean, that was brilliant because Vegas is a 24-hour is town and there's gonna be lots of victims available walking the streets. But originally, originally when the vampire uh, novels were written and so forth, the idea was to have it in a strange place, some remote place. So that's why you have Transylvania, Romania, Bulgaria, all these kind of places that none of us have been that are rather mysterious and they have which I think is a great name for a mountain range, the Carpathian Mountains. That's where, so, so that all the settings of, of the castles and, and, and the locations and everything all added to the vampire myth, okay? And so, again, you run into statement, this is just, this, uh, this is a statement just as I close this out. This is the kind of thing you run into vampire fiction. They'll write something like this. They'll write something like Sarah, 1630, this is on our gravestone, From, for the sake of the, of the dead and the welfare of the living, let this sepulcher remain untouched and its occupant undisturbed until the coming of Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So they, they, they'd, they'd use religion as this you know, element to combat the vampires. The other thing that was revealed in the Dracula book was Dracula will not hurt you if you do not 
what the, is he uses word cross the threshold. The threshold is when you walk across the entrance to his castle. If you willingly walk across the entrance to his castle, you're as good as dead. But if you stay in front of it and you don't enter the castle, he won't bother you. But of course, again, that's all changed now with the, the, the movies we got and everything. So, you know, vampires are all over the place. I just think of this one movie as I close out here. Of what, you know, they're all looking for new ways to excite the audience. And there were a bunch of vampires in, uh, in this uh, building. And uh, so they pulled up in a Jeep with a winch. And so the vampire hunters ran into the building and they slapped the winch onto the vampires, you know, under their legs or neck or something. And then they flipped the switch and then the winch pulled the vampires out of the building into the sunlight and they exploded. I mean, so Hollywood is always trying to think of some new way to, to portray a vampire or the type of vampire or whatever. So with that, I'll close and just let you know, hey, vampires rule, and they're never going away. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So on that note, we're going to do a little shameless plug for TMCC Theater. Uh, right now, they are doing the play Dracula. It's adapted by two of the professors right here from this college. Um, I've heard some great things. It's running until October 30th. Uh, our website does have information. If you want information before that on your way out, just hit me up and I'll be glad to share it with you. But again, that's down at TMCC the Theater on Keystone, running until October 30th at 2 p.m. So next up, we have Karen Witt uh, Wickender. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Wickender, the monsters at the end of the book. So let's see what happens when humans are the real monsters. Okay. All right. So let's get started with this trope. Um, I'm sure it's not a surprising one to you if you know anything about pop culture, if you've watched any television shows, um, films, literature, anything like that. Um, it's pretty common. In fact, I would argue that it's potentially at this point overused. Um, it's, it's something we're all familiar with when we watch, um, when we watch a film that has an apocalyptic future, alien invasion, anything with monsters. Is it really a surprise when it turns out that the monster is actually us? Uh, zombies come to mind. Um, and then we all discover shock horror that we're the worst monsters of all, which is why I'm wearing a Negan shirt. I'm not actually a sociopath who supports him, but I figured this week of any, we totally got the monster as human with Negan, so, um, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about. So, I'm gonna tweak it a little bit, and what I wanna talk about are supernatural shows that traditionally hunt monsters, and they have like an episode of the week in which the human becomes the true monster. I'm gonna talk about three shows, and um, the one I'm gonna end with is one of the most controversial episodes in the 90s at least, um, but it's still talked about as kind of one of the most disgusting episodes on television. So I'm going to start with The Twilight Zone, um, an episode called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. And I'm going to give a shout out to Sky Parko, who uh, is the one, hey, Sky's over there, yay, um, who I was talking to Sky about my topic. And he said, hey, have you ever watched The Twilight Zone? This episode is amazing. So I watched it the other day, and I thought, well, this is actually a great episode to start with. Um, basically, what you have is a traditional American neighborhood. Um, white picket fence, uh, everything you kind of expect, uh, convivial, oh, and I broke it, sorry. <laughs> My students are like, this is so typical. Uh, thank you. <laughs> if it's broken, it must be Wickander. Uh, so you have a, I'm not blushing. If you have a neighborhood, uh, convivial, everybody's playing outside, kids are playing outside, people are washing their cars. Good thing to note, starts in the daytime. Uh, because I'm going to talk about nighttime with our third uh, show. So it starts in the daytime. There's this loud noise, kind of a roar, um, flashing lights. Nobody really knows what's happening. Um, they decide that it's a meteor shower. And, um, but all the power goes out. Telephones don't work. Cars don't work. Like basically, it's just everything is kind of exterminated. Um, so what breeds fear in this episode is actually the loss of things that we think make us safe. 
And in this instance, it's power, like electricity, <laughs> that, you know, that gives us light. Even though it's daytime and they don't have power, they're still really discombobulated. And then the fact that they don't have these tools for communication. So there's no way to call someone and see what's happened. Um, and then the other thing is the monster story, which is like, if you watch this episode, you're like, shut up, Tommy. That's Tommy at the bottom. Because what happens is, is the group is trying to be, there's like a rational component of the group that's freaking out. And they're saying like, well, hey, let's just go walk down into downtown, find out if we can find an answer. And then Tommy says, no, they don't want you to do that. They don't want you to do that. And, it, and it, the whole group is kind of like, ah, oh, Tommy, that's so funny. You read such scary stuff. And he's like, but this is what happens. You're not supposed to leave. You probably even can't leave. And, and what's interesting is there's n enough of kind of this fear mentality that instead of just laughing at a kid who's telling you that the monsters are coming, they stay and they don't try. And one neighbor does eventually try to go to another, like just around the block to see if it's happening there. But it, it, it basically stops everyone in their tracks. They don't go back inside their homes. They don't actually try to figure out what's happening. And they ask Tommy for more details. And he lets them know that usually in the alien stories, they send people down in advance who look human. And so what the neighborhood decides is perhaps we've been invaded by the other. And so they start to say, there's a family that doesn't belong here. We need to find that family and we need to get rid of them. So then they're trying to decide who doesn't fit, like what person is, is like the, the person who has the odd behavior, or in this case, who didn't come out and freak out at the same time that we were all freaking out. They get mad at the person who has insomnia and walks around at night and looks at the stars. And they were like, who are you to look at the stars? M normal people don't look at the stars, they're sleeping. And so they decide, and his name is Les Goodman, good man, um, and they decide that he's it. So like he's the, he's the one. And what happens is this mob mentality, and the character played by Claude Akins, who's on the right, he actually says like, hey, let's not devolve into mob mentality. Um, that, does not, that does not work. It, it just gets worse. So what happens is they're all gathered Someone, this guy, actually, if you go back, if I go back to three, oh God, sorry, bad idea. That guy, um, the guy who's bleeding in the further picture, you see he's got a gun. And so he had gone into his home and grabbed a weapon because he was like, we have to protect ourselves because now it's dark. And of course, everything's scarier in the dark. And what they do is they can see in the distance someone approaching and you, the audience, know it's the neighbor, the old neighbor who has gone to another neighborhood. But they freak out. I mean, they're all screaming and they're like, we have to kill it, we have to kill it, we have to kill it. It's a little Lord of the Flies too. Um, and so this guy shoots and they, and kills him. Kills the old man. And then they realize it's just old man Farnsworth. I can't remember his name. But um, <laughs> so then they're like, oh my God, it's not him. Who is it? It's this guy. And so then they decide it's this guy because they're like, you shot him. We told you not to shoot him and you shot him. And um, it's like the lottery and they grab rocks and they're throwing rocks at him. And then he's like, I'm just trying to protect my home. He came out of the darkness. And so it just turns into madness. There's no one with a, that's speaking the voice of reason. And Les Goodman even says like, yeah, let's get them. And you know it's really bad because, um, I didn't want to go there yet, because I had joked when I saw it, like I was watching it and I was like, God, Tommy needs to be punched in the face. I'm like, he just needs to, oh, somebody needs to shut him down. Well then pretty soon they're like, we need to kill Tommy. It's Tommy. He's decided that he, he's the one who told us all about this. And it's like, you're going to kill a child. Like, don't kill Tommy. Um, but it just, it lapses into madness. And while it kind of breaks my, my uh, plot that there actually are aliens, they're just observing us. And by disrupting power, they're basically saying like, hey, we've been evaluating all these places and um, yeah, the, these people can't be trusted with anything because when you put them in a compromising position, all they do is try to find an enemy and that enemy is themselves. And so then it ends with Rod Serling's um, commentary, which of course is very uh, <laughs> prescient because it still very much applies today to our othering of people and people in neighborhoods. Even, I don't know if anybody watches Blackish, but like the Halloween episode of Blackish, one of the 
one of the people in the neighborhood is like, yeah, we couldn't control those other people, those people from poorer communities who come in and trick or treat in our rich neighborhood. And I thought, oh, so not much has changed. They're not throwing rocks at Tommy, but you know, it's that same kind of idea that the thoughts, attitudes, and prejudices that are found in the mind of, minds of men can't be controlled and turn out, especially in this instance, to be, um, to be the worst monster of all. And he ends with this, and the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the Twilight Zone. If you've never watched the Twilight Zone before, you should watch it. It's streaming on Netflix. I'm not telling you not to do your homework, but it's streaming on Netflix. Um, and there, there are, it's very scary how much he knew, how much he anticipated, and how he truly understands the human condition. Now I'm gonna jump way forward, and I'm gonna talk about Supernatural, which, Again, streaming on Netflix, not that I'm telling you to watch it, but you should. So um, this is absolutely a monster show. This is the Winchesters, their brothers, um, they're hunting, they're hunting things, um, saving people, it's a family business. So they, they, usually, they usually hunt monsters like demons, scary children, <laughs> zombies, <laughs> zombie children, um, vampires, werewolves, um, uh, 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 the gin, um, the Wendigo, that's right, the Wendigo, the uh, evil scarecrow, reapers, they fight the devil himself and Lilith, who's taking the form of a scary child with lots of blood on her, um, and then clowns, because clowns are terrifying and you should always fight them. So these are the, these are the things that the Winchesters normally hunt, right? They're, they're in the hunt for monsters. And they, they waste no time. It's season one where they start tackling the human monster. And so what happens in this episode is they show up in a town to investigate a case. The kid who has seen someone disappear thinks he's heard a monster, um, like a kind of Godzilla or a velociraptor, or a, you know, a, a, a dinosaur. And so Sam, the younger brother, pictured there, Jared Padalecki, um, he gets taken. And so we don't know what's taken him. We are assuming, because it's monsters, that it's some kind of monster. And there's somebody else in a cage, too. When we see him, he's in this cage. And he basically says, like, what are they? And the guy doesn't understand, because most people don't say, like, oh, well, you know, they're demons, or it's the devil, or, you know. The, and, and Sam is shocked, because he's like, I'll be damned. They're just people. And so it's your first sense of, like, oh, OK. Well, this isn't going to be normal. And then, um, by the way, the sheriff, like, or one of the cops, like, tops, talks to that really scary girl, and it's like, no, 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 don't go near the kid. Like, that's a crazy-looking kid. Don't go near her. Um, but it's a CW, so she's still a cute kid. So Dean and Dean eventually finds them. It's a house. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's your typical like Texas Chainsaw Massacre horror movie home. Um, Dean finds where Sam is, and then they have this interaction, which I think is pretty funny, <laughs> which is, you know, dude, they're just people. And Dean's saying, like, what, what, are, what do they want? And Sam's like, I have no idea. Like, I don't understand. And Dean really makes the point of the episode here, which is, yeah, that's the point. You know, with our usual playmates, there's rules, there's patterns. But with people, they're just crazy. And I think it's a really interesting point, too, because when you watch the show, you, can, you realize, like, you can build an encyclopedia of monsters and supernatural. They follow the rules. They have patterns. They have traditions. Humans are chaos. And that's what's so terrifying about the episodes where humans are the monster, is that they are these chaos figures. So this is, uh, Dean gets captured too. Um, they get better at their job. But, but basically he's asking the guy, like, what, what is this? Like, what are you guys doing? And what's terrifying to them is that here you've got these guys who are called hunters, who are hunting demons and monsters and trying to make the world a better place. And then you have this guy, the guy with the cap, Pa, who, who says, I've hunted all my life just like my father is before him. And it comes out that really what they're doing is they're taking people, not enough to get like on anybody's radar, but they're taking them and they're hunting them. So they release them out into the <laughs> wilderness and then they chase them down and hunt them and treat them just like they would their kills. And so, you know, you've got the scenes with Dean walking through the house and seeing what they're doing. And um, just this idea, because a, Another question that gets asked of Pa is like, but why? And he, he just looks, he's laughing and he's like, because it's fun. 
And that's what's so terrifying, of course, is that there is no rational behavior here. There is nothing we can compartmentalize and understand. We can understand vampires, werewolves, um, you know, reapers, wendigos. You know, we can understand the animalistic behavior, but what do we do with someone who just likes to hunt people because it's fun? And that, that adds to that terror level. Or as Dean says, I'll say it again, demons, I get. People are crazy. So um, before I end up with the last one, which is my longest one, um, I wanted to have a brief Twin Peaks interlude because it's not a presentation if it doesn't have Twin Peaks in it. Um, also, I really tried to figure out a way to make this work, and I couldn't. Um, and I also want to say that when I tried to add this to my presentation, it broke my computer. IT had to show up. Like, I'm not kidding. So Twin Peaks is possessed. Um, but one of the reasons I want to talk about Twin Peaks is because with the thing I'm about to show you could not exist without Twin Peaks. Um, Twin Peaks in the 90s, there'd never been anything like it on TV. Um, I didn't do that. So um, <laughs> there'd never been anything like it on TV. They sold it as a soap opera. <laughs> this is not a soap opera. And it, it instituted like a level of violence in television that we hadn't seen before. It's so mellow now compared to the violence that's on TV now. Sunday night's episode of The Walking Dead is proof of that. But there's a difference between the gore and the bloodshed and showing someone's brain exploding on camera. There's a difference between that and what Twin Peaks does and what the X-Files does. And that is the tension and fear that they brought in, the way that they interrogated this human monster. Because even though I technically couldn't work Twin Peaks in because it's like got demonic possession in it, there's still the question of, even with the possession of Bob, how much of your stealth is still there? How much of your dark side does it bring out? How much of the human monster you know, comes out in moments like this. But seriously, in the 90s, there was nothing as terrifying as Twin Peaks. And if you, you should watch that. That's also streaming on Netflix. And it's way <laughs> short. I think there's like 20 episodes. You guys can totally do that. You don't need to write papers. Go watch Twin Peaks. Um, <laughs> don't tell your professors I said that. So this is the X-Files episode I'm going to talk about. Um, had, has anybody seen this? One, two. It's the most controversial episode of the X-Files ever to air. Um, it's the most controversial episode of broadcast television ever aired. Um, and <laughs> Morgan and Wong, who wrote the episode, didn't think it was actually going to be that big of a deal. They never understood the controversy. It aired on October 11th, 1966. Um, it was, no, thank you, 1996. I'm all right. It's OK. So um, is there a volume? I could if I hadn't thrown the mouse. <laughs> Why'd you throw the mouse? I'll replay it. It's magic. There's no there's volume. The panel up on the top there? No, there's no panel. That's what I was looking for. Something. Oh. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that worked. Now is that too loud? Probably too loud. No, you okay? Um, it's really funny because this aired when I was in grad school and one of the people in the English department with me actually wrote a letter of complaint to Fox about this episode and they sent her like signed pictures of David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. So clearly they didn't actually pay attention to what was happening. Um, but, okay, so one of the interesting things, because this didn't actually really happen ever again, they never aired this on broadcast TV 
again. Um, obviously, it says they did three years later. They ran a they ran a um, marathon of X Files episodes. It was the number one request for an episode to be shown, particularly because this is the era before DVRs. So the only way you could actually see this episode again is if you had VHS tapes and you had recorded it. I'm not saying I did, but I did. So, um, <laughs> but I will say, it's so disturbing that even though I had it on VHS, I did not watch it again. Um, and so th this, this was like, this kind of interrogated the human condition and human nature in, in ways that, in fact, were called Lynchian. So um, it was said in reviews at the time that David Lynch would be proud of what had been produced. Um, it starts, I actually rewatched this the other day, and I rewatched it in daylight. Um, it's still that scary. Um, but it starts with an opening that I don't know how they actually got approved. Um, there, you, and it's very, the episode is very dark, like literally, like you cannot see things. So you have no idea what's happening. There's a woman screaming. It's clearly a birth. There's a lot of blood and rusty tools, a screaming child who they take outside and bury alive. And the end of the teaser is actually the shot from the baby's perspective of the dirt coming on top of it. Um, then it cuts to um, the brother. These are the brothers. Well, you don't know they're brothers at this point. But these are the three men burying the child, clearly still upset about it. And then the discovery, because you've got a bunch of kids who are playing baseball. So you've immediately got this juxtaposition between this terror house and then what is basically the ideal American town. In fact, at the beginning, Mulder even says, this is the type of town where I would like to live, where your kids can play in the field, and there's baseball, and everybody's happy, and no one locks their doors. And um, the kids are playing baseball, and it's just a sandlot game, and the kid is digging his feet in, and discovers the blood and the hand, and then Mulder and Scully appear. It's definitely an interrogation of uh, one of my favorite phrases, which I kind of picked up from Erica Bine, which is the seedy underbelly, which is David Lynch's favorite thing. Because what this is, is um, <laughs> uh, Mulder even says, there's something rotten in Mayberry. And that is Sheriff Andy Taylor. And so they even use the names from um, Mayberry, to kind of highlight the fact, I mean, Sheriff Taylor's not only upset about the kid being found, he's upset because their way of life is going to be disturbed. They're a town that hasn't been bothered by the outside world. They're not a city. The entire time, he's just lamenting the fact that this is going to change their town, that he doesn't carry a gun, that they don't lock their doors. And I'll tell you, too, growing up at that time, you could still find town. I grew up in a town where we never locked our doors, ever. Like, people left their cars running and ran into the store. Like, so this, this idea of kind of this small town and what you can get away with and that sense of security, but what there is is this peacock house. And nobody disturbs it. Nobody goes there. No one bothers them. The sheriff hints at the fact that they do their own breeding, <laughs> which will, is obviously very important. Um, they have no electricity. They have no running water. They um, have basically lived in this house since the Civil War. That's the brothers sitting and watching them. The sheriff won't even go there. Won't even go there to interrogate them. He's just like, no, we just need to leave them alone and do our own thing. Um, that's a welcome on their uh, steps is the pig's head. And this is probably one of the most disturbing scenes in the episode. I'm not going to show the whole thing. Um, this is the. The boys have been, there's been a warrant put out for their arrest. And what it does is it intercuts between our three people, Sheriff Taylor, Agent Mulder, Agent Scully. You're not sure who, that they're, com who they're coming to get. Johnny Mathis refused to give permission for the use of this song, so they found a Johnny Mathis like sing-alike, voice-alike, who could actually sing the song so that they could use it. Um, but there's a cognitive dissonance in play here with this um, like warm-hearted song called "Wonderful, Wonderful," that they're playing. And here you should be saying, "Lock your, lock your door." 
Building up your tension. It's just just a little, just a couple more seconds. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you know what's gonna happen next. I won't show you what's gonna happen next. It's actually horrifying. No, I'm not gonna, no, 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 I'm not gonna show you. Um, go ahead, it's, it's streaming. You can watch it on Netflix. Um, I don't think Mai can handle it, so I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not gonna show it. It's actually, ironically, if you do watch The Walking Dead, it's very similar to what happened on Sunday night's episode. They have clubs. Um, they can't actually be hurt because they're so genetically inbred, they can't feel pain. Um, and they, basically the three men um, beat him to death and then she's hiding under the bed, he tells his wife to hide under the bed and as the, his blood pools under the blood bed, they find her and you don't actually, thank God, you don't see her being killed, but they're, they're both slaughtered. It's actually a horrifying moment um, and terrifying because of that cognitive dissonance. Um, and, and so what we find out is, of course, because not everything is revealed at, at the beginning, but what you have is a family that has been breeding. It's our little Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of thing. It was actually based on a story also that Charlie Chaplin told. Um, but this is really the point here. Um, Mulder was listening to an animal behavior thing on his very uh, old TV that wasn't getting reception in that town. And basically what he tries to explain to Scully is, this is animal behavior. We think humans are civilized and they're not. They actually result, you know, they will go back to this kind of murder when, when, when they want to. And in this case, that's what they're doing. They're prehistoric, they're cavemen. And um, he's like, basically, we're the invaders trying to go into the den and take away their one chance at reproducing. And up to this point, Scully has basically thought that there, there's a woman captured in the house. Um, that's not true. <laughs> Um, but they are trying to go into the den. It's a, it's a, as you saw from the trailer, they've set up booby traps. Um, and what they find is another horrifying moment, which is a quadriplegic woman under the bed uh, who is their mother. And so it turns out that the two younger brothers are the children of the brother and the mother. Um, and it's just basically like she says, this is their way of life and these are the people trying to stop it. And it kind of evokes back to that first episode, the Twilight Zone episode, where it's like, I'm just trying to protect my property, which is a very American thing, right? Don't go on my land. I can do whatever I want when I'm, you're on my land. And so what we have here is basically just this interrogation of the worst kind of human beings you can find, um, and the most controversial episode of television to air. Uh, thanks, to the, uh, thanks to Twin Peaks. But um, yeah, so what, what you have in the human episodes are just basically an examination of why, what it is in our behavior, and just to remind us at the end of the day, we are animals. So that's it, I know I need to end, so. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, now that we know we're all monsters, uh, you can go out and become monsters. We're gonna have to skip over the question period just because we're running really late on time. So um, put your hands together for Fred Horlocker, is that right? Who is going to give you a little discussion about what happens after we're horrible, horrible human beings and die. <laughs> okay, um, I've been asked to tell a ghost story. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, if you do me a favor, if you'd kind of come to the center in the first four rows, because when you tell a story, you want your audience to be close to you. <laughs> not far away, not out of reach. Yeah. 
These are the brave ones that are moving. <laughs> Others that are a little nervous will hang back. And even the most nervous will leave. <laughs> I'm a retired Nevada history teacher from Reed High School in Sparks. And uh, I had a history club there at Reed, and the last year that I taught, I had 180 students in my club. And of course, Halloween was very special to us for two reasons. It was Halloween, and Nevada became a state on October 31st. The only state in the country that became a state on Halloween. So when you go trick-or-treating, <laughs> you can keep that in the back of your mind, that this was a ghostly thing to do to uh, make us a state. Of course, back in 1864, they weren't talking about Halloween, so <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with it. Okay, I've been to Virginia City at night. One of my students came to me one day and said, Mr. Horlacher, we've got to go to Virginia City and see the glowing headstone." I said, the glowing headstone? And he said, yes, it glows. I said, are you sure? He said, yes, I've seen it glow. So we gathered my history club into cars, went up there on Halloween, October 31st, went by the Catholic Church and looked across to the north, and there are 13 cemeteries there on the north side of Virginia City. And he said, I see it, I see it. And the rest of us were looking. We didn't see anything. And I thought, oh gosh, you're having a hallucination. <laughs> and he said, no, no, it's there. I, he said, come right over next to me. And then he pointed and I saw it glowing in the dark. I had overlooked it ignored it because it was so bright that I didn't think it was a headstone. That's how bright it was. Then I looked through binoculars and it was still glowing. And I thought, we've got to go over to that cemetery and we have to find that glowing headstone. And so we went and parked by the Catholic cemetery and walked down around the corner to where this glowing headstone was located. And as we got within about 30 feet of it, it was glowing. We took a few more steps and it stopped. Now, I told my high school students, well probably it's just reflecting a lot of light from somewhere in Virginia City. And there was a street light down in the canyon there uh, a few hundred yards away. He said, oh no, he said, I've been up here when the lights have been out and the electricity was off and I saw it glowing. Now, I haven't been up there for years and I don't know if it still glows, but I'm going to tell you a story now about something that happened a hundred years earlier in the mines at Virginia City. Uh, can we turn that off? that possible? I don't think I need Dracula to go down the mine with me here. <laughs> and uh, turn off these lights right here. Ah, <laughs> oh, ha, 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 ha. Now, this is the time. You have to remember that in the early days of Virginia City, miners came from England, from the coal mines, from the 1850s and traditions long before that of banshees and ghosts and spirits of the night. And they brought those old world traditions with them into the mines of Virginia City. Those Cornish miners 
were superstitious. So one day in the mines, one of the miners, and they started to get into an elevator, a hoist to go down into the work mine where they could work, and they had their lanterns with them, of course. Now, they had a candle in their lantern, but you can see that even this has limited light, and yet this is what they worked by for their shift down underground, and it was hot down there, and it was moist, and it was dangerous. As this elevator started to go down the shaft, one of the men had put in a new candle in his lantern, so he was testing it, holding it at arm's length as they passed these old abandoned tunnels where the ore had been removed. And as it went slowly down past one of these, he was stunned to realize as he shined his light down that tunnel, there were two bright, red, glowing dots in the dark. <gasps> he was frightened. He turned to his companions. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yes, I saw that. Ring the signal bell. Pull the rope. Pull the rope. Let's get out of here. And they rose to the surface. Because as they went up to the surface, one of them said, wasn't that the tunnel where old Jake died two months ago when the tunnel collapsed on him and we never recovered his body. Yes, that is the tunnel where old Jake was buried by the rocks. They arrived up on the surface and then refused to go down the mine. We're not going. You can't make us go. Well, the foreman came and he said, what's the matter? Well, we're not going down there. There's a terrible, terrible spirit down there. Something evil is down there. We're not going down. Well, a mine is no good unless it's producing. So one of the superintendents of the mine came to the foreman and he said, We've got to have these men go back to work. You go down and find out what the problem is, will you? Well, he wasn't very enthusiastic about going down himself, but he knew it had to be done. So he put on his miner's helmet, and this is a Virginia City helmet from a mine there. And so he started down with his lantern. It's backwards? No, it isn't. <laughs> it's, by the way, it's made out of cardboard. If a rock hits you on the head with this, it'd be bad shape, but anyway. <laughs> so the foreman got on the elevator, told the hoist operator what level to stop on, and he went down. Now, when that elevator stopped, first thing that foreman did was to hold that lantern just as far out in front of him as he could, his eyes searching the darkness. He didn't see anything. And for a moment, he thought, ah, there's nothing here. I'm going to go back up. Uh, but they're going to ask me, did you go down the tunnel where we saw those lights? So he said, I guess I'll have to go down the tunnel. So he started down the tunnel. Oh, cautiously, yes. Oh, with halting steps. And of course, a rock wall on both sides of him and overhead and below him. And he went a short distance. There in the light of his lantern, he saw those bright red glowing dots in the dark. And he stood, he st stunned, frightened. He didn't move. The lights disappeared. 
And he shook his head. I must be seeing things. But his heart beat faster. Beads of perspiration broke out upon his forehead. And then he did a most peculiar thing. He said, if there is something there, it can see me, and I can't see it. So I'll turn off my lantern and wait. I'm going to lean my back against this rock wall so that I know nothing can be behind me. And I'm going to wait. And that's what he did. His heart was pounding. It's pitch black, absolutely black. He can't see even a finger on his nose. And then he hears something. Click, click, click. Oh, it stopped. His breathing became more extreme. <sighs> and he heard it again. Click, click, click. And whatever it was, he knew it was getting closer to him. Now, he needed light. He grabbed his lantern and fumbled to get it to turn on. But it didn't light. Click, click. <laughs> and he jumped, and he darn near hit that rocky ceiling. At last, the lantern was lit. And then, in the light of the lantern, he saw the cause of all this terrible commotion. It was a goat, a billy goat that had wandered into the tunnels of Virginia City and was trying to find its way out. And now and then its eyes caught the glow from the lanterns and lit up red. <laughs> That's it, good enough. Uh, that was pretty incredible, actually. I, I had no idea it would be a goat. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, um, yeah, I got my goat. Got my goat. Yes, um, so on that, we'll welcome the punter over here. Um, Professor Wade Hampton is going to share, share a little bit about H.P. Lovecraft. So if you can please put your hands together and welcome <laughs> Professor Hampton up. Well, I was reading up on H.P. Lovecraft, but uh, before I did that, uh, I've been mulling over what this, uh, this seminar is today, and um, I, my mind kept coming back to the Odyssey, which has some of the most horrific monsters in it. And um, when you read through it, you come across them again and, and again, and because it's a classic text, you don't think about it in terms of horror. But I wanted to go over it a little bit before I get into H.P. Lovecraft and um, talk about um, what's horrible in it. Well, one of the scenes is when Odysseus goes to the underworld and he slaughters an animal. I forget what it, if it's a goat or a, a sheep. And the blood runs into a trench. And then the ghosts come forward. And he has to block them from drinking the blood. Then they start drinking the blood, and color starts coming to their face. And then they're able to speak with Odysseus. And so he has these, a series of interviews with everyone from, his, uh, from Menelaus, who's been murdered. Not Menelaus, um, the one who killed uh, with Clytemnestra? Agamemnon. Agamemnon, thank you. Ag 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 Agamemnon, he talks with her. Agamemnon gives him uh, a warning about uh, wives, <laughs> returning to wives, of course. And uh, then he also talks with Achilles. And Achilles, he kind of banters with Achilles and says, well, it's not so bad down here. 
And Achilles has a wonderful answer to him. He says, shut up, Odysseus. He says, I would spend you know, my days uh, working for some brutal farmer just to have a little bit of sunlight down here. So don't talk to me about being you know, king in hell. So there's that. And then the one that I think appeals to kids the most uh, to the EU factor is the Cyclops. He eats people and they're dribbling out of his mouth. And, and then at the end, of course, we know how he conquers the Cyclops. They get this red hot uh, end of a, like a big stick. Olive yeah, olive tree. And then they just drill it into his eye and, and rotate it and really get it in there. I mean, that would have killed him, really. I mean, but uh, it just goes, ah, ah. And then there's, there, it's kind of spoiled by the joke about uh, no one killed me, right? And he goes into a kind of a silly pun there, uh, which is, it works. But the most, the, perhaps for the people involved at least, the most horrible part is when Odysseus fires the arrow through all the uh, axe uh, heads, and he says, I'm back, and he shuts all the doors and starts, uh, makes slaughter in the great hall. But there's a lead up to that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this, just a bit. Uh, this is a, a portent just before the murder uh, begins. It's in book 22. So Telemachus is talking, or Telemachus, and Pallas Athena touched the suitor's mind with hysteria. This is just brief, I'll read it out loud. They couldn't stop laughing, and as they laughed, it seemed to them that their jaws were not theirs, and the meat that they ate was dabbled with blood. Tears filled their eyes and their hearts raced. Then the seer, Theoclamenus, said among them, Wretches, what wicked thing is this that you suffer? You are shrouded in night from top to toe. Lamentations flare. Your cheeks melt with tears, and the walls of the house are spattered with blood. The porch and the court are crowded with ghosts, streaming down to the undergloom. The sun is gone from heaven, and an evil mist spreads over the land. Thus the seer. And they just giggled at him. Eurymachus was the first to actually speak. This newly arrived, they just go in to think he's silly. This newly arrived stranger has lost his mind. Quick, get him outside since he thinks it's night in here. To which the seer, Theoclimenus, replied, and this is the end of this. I don't need any escorts, Eurymachus. I have eyes, ears, and my own two feet, and a mind in good working order. I'll leave under my own power, for I can see evil coming upon you inescapable evil for every last one of you who in your blind pride do violence to the house of Odysseus. So what do we have there? Some people kind of going into a weird trance, they're laughing, their jaws are not their own, their, the, blood, the blood starts streaming down the walls. Truly a Lovecraftian moment actually uh, in terms of just sheer horror. And this is just like one little bit of the Odyssey. I think it, 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 it works. It still has legs, as they say, right? Did it, did it touch you? Did you feel that? Anyway, just a little bit out of the Odyssey. And then he kills everyone, and of course, there's just a lot of blood and guts. Uh, and then, the, of course, the maids have to clean it up, and then that's a pretty horrible one too, right? He strings them up, and their feet quivered, but just for a little bit. That's an awful detail. That's an <laughs> awful detail. Okay, so H.P. Lovecraft, he's a 20th cent, early 20th century uh, writer of weird tales. Uh, that's, they're, they're having issues with nomenclature. What is horror? What is weird? What is this? Supernatural. And uh, they, they're, uh, they, this uh, area of writing is kind of settling on the term weird tales. And of course, H.P. Lovecraft is a master of weird tales. He was born in kind of a weird place. I mean, if you've ever been there, you might agree. Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> Yeah, and the whole area of the of the Middle East of the of the of, <laughs> of New England, it has a a feel to it. Like I, I had visited there uh, when I was in my fifties, and I, I had already read Lovecraft, and I could really feel why he wrote uh, what he wrote from living in this area. There's just something. There's a darkness there. Uh, um, they talk about he. he he develops the themes that come out of the haunted nature of New England with the Salem witch trials. And he says that there's some evil brooding over the land of New England. A lot of his stories have to do with this evil brooding in the <coughs> land. 
And if you want to get a good sense of that, I mean, she was talking about films. Um, it, was, it was kind of a B movie, but it, it worked, I thought. Um, it's called The Blair Witch Project, where they go into a, a forest and they're just, it's a mockumentary. And uh, they get taken through the, uh, uh, I mean, they get reamed in, in, the, uh, in that movie. You anyway, know, so a woman filming, and these people are, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to find the witch. And guess what? They find her, you know, and she's not so friendly at all. I remember this old woman says, she has hair all over her body like a horse. <laughs> and they're filming her, right? Anyway, it gives a sense about the uh, kind of this brooding evil over New England. Well, H.P. Lovecraft actually designs it further. He has a famous Miskatonic University on the Miskatonic River. Obviously, we're probably uh, talking about, um, you know, some, I don't know, one of those places up there. It, it, it could be, what is that, Bowdoin, or it could be uh, um, what Harvard itself. But he invents his own Miskatonic University where they have an almanac of the mad Arab al-Hazred, you know, where he has all these readings from this, these ancient... Uh, times. So he is also very much of a racist. He's, uh, you, when you read it, you have to kind of go, oh God, yeah, this is a pretty kind of reeks here. He's like, uh, talking about people of mixed races, like it's some sort of defilement of their blood. You know, uh, what, what I was just reading a line that says, a Negroid uh, person of nautical aspect you know, jostled him, and then later on the guy dies from uh, having been jostled by this film. So he's always, you have to like uh, watch it with, with him, or he, has, he should have watched it, I guess would be the best. He's, he, he's a very much of a product of his time, right, which was uh, just accepted racism as, as normative, and we don't. And so if you, it, it'll um, perhaps uh, taint your reading of H.P. Lovecraft if you're kind of going, God, this guy's really a racist, because uh, he is. I mean, he... Uh, was constantly involved with themes of blood purity, too. So he didn't like uh, impurities coming in. It catches also, if you've ever traveled around that area, there's kind of this international exotic savor that you don't really think belongs with Boston or Providence or any of those ports going up to Maine there. And yet those captains traveled all over the world. They brought back all kinds of weird stuff, tiki's and just strangeness. Uh, these ship captains, they were involved with the opium trade, right? So they were getting everyone addicted to opium over there and making money and investing it in the United States. This is perfectly true. They actually have pictures of this one particular Chinese middleman that I've seen in like four different houses back there. It's always the same guy who was the wealthiest man in the world at the time. So there's this involvement with exotica that comes through with these old sea captains. And again, he picks up on that a little bit too. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do I was going to read from, uh, well, let me just do what I was going to do. Um, okay, this is from his signature text, what I consider to be his signature text, The Call of Cthulhu. And again, you start running into problems already with his weird pronunciations. He says it's supposed to be pronounced like with a snarl. Cthulhu. <laughs> I don't know what he wants me to do with that. You know, it's like you can't even, you have to have a snout uh, to say the word correctly. Uh, yeah, it's Cthulhu Fatania. This is this wickedness, this deep uh, antique evil that still is under the surface of the world and will r rise up and haunts men's dreams. Th this is what he's actually talking about in the text. And I'll read just uh, the first part of it, and I'm not going to uh, tarry too long here. He's a wonderful uh, to read, and, and really mainly what he's done is he's created a whole genre, uh, like especially in England. England has picked up on Lovecraft big time. England, uh, what I've read about the Cthulhu mythos in England, is like 10 times bigger than the original whatever Lovecraft wrote. I mean, there's a bunch of people writing in this vein. So it's uh, very um, popular in areas that still appreci that appreciate horror or written horror. So if you want to read Cthulhu mythos, it's out there. I mean, you can just look it up in your Kindle if you want to. Um, so. This is the horror in clay, the first part. And he says something which I think is really true. I actually was thinking about it going, you know, there's really a truth here. He says, the, the most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But someday, 
the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly sight into the peace and safety of a new dark age, right? But that whole notion of being able to correlate all the different parts of your mind and put them together into like a, a, a whole vision, that's a, a, an interesting notion, right? I mean, vis uh, uh, apropos of this, I was uh, just thinking back to uh, uh, something on NPR about uh, three years ago, Wade uh, Goodwin, who is their reporter from Texas. He said, he's talking, he's talking to the sheriff. And the sheriff was saying, can't explain it. There's a spaceship up there. It was as, he said, this is what really kills me. He says, it was as big as a Walmart. <laughs> and he said, it was just hanging over the city. And we all saw it. Did you see it, Henry? Yeah, I saw it too. And, and so they're talking about this. Uh, and then he said, the, then the, you know, it's a proverbial thing, the US Air Force jets come over. And then the, he said, the thing just went straight up and disappeared, right? And it was gone. So, and of course, the Air Force denies anything about it, right? Of course, they would do that. But that stuck in my mind. I mean, these guys didn't sound like they were lying, the sheriff. So what do you do with that kind of a content of your mind? How do you correlate that with anything, really? I mean, with a, a spaceship the size of Walmart hovering over a Texas town? <laughs> my god. So I'll read a little bit more. To, this, this will give you a hint uh, of it. And then you'll like it or not. I mean, you'll, he has very short stories. This one's kind of a longer, like a novella. And uh, it's about this powerful evil surfaces in the deep. It sleeps deep under the sea in the uh, realm of Arlaye. Cthulhu Fatanya sleeps, and he shall one day awaken, right? But he's, she's, it's shifting. It's like a deep tectonic ship, and it's starting to come up and infect the imaginations of people, like of all these decadent artists and stuff. And they're starting to paint and do weird people going insane in, in insane asylums. I mean, just. You know, people really racking out big time. And he says, uh, and that's why he's talking about if we could correlate all these things, we'd go crazy thinking because there's this big dark entity down below the sea. So he goes on to say just on this one page, theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons, which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. Do you see where he's going with this? Well, let's see where he's going with it. So he goes further, and then there's a dark cult in Louisiana, something out of True Detective, maybe. And um, these people are dancing around this little idol, and the inspector finds the idol, and he takes it up to an anthropological conference in uh, St. Louis, and that's where... Uh, they have the inspector tell his story. So I'll tell it in brief. They, uh, and here we go with his racism. It says, most were a seaman and a sprinkling of Negroes and mulattoes, right? I mean, he's right in on it. Like, that's a... <laughs> um, largely West Indians and Brava Portuguese from the Cape Verde Islands. Again, you get that sense of, you know, blends, unsavory blends. He's, he's always into that. Um, uh, gave a, a coloring of voodooism to the heterogeneous cult. But before many questions were asked, it became manifest that something far deeper and older than Negro fetishism was involved. Degraded and ignorant as they were, the creatures held with surprising consistency to the central idea of their loathsome faith. They worshiped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men and who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones are, are, were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies had told their secrets in dreams to the first men who formed a cult which had never died. This was the cult, and the prisoners said it had always existed and always would exist, it, hidden in distant wastes and dark places all over the world until the time when the great priest Cthulhu, with his dark house and the mighty sea of Arleye under the water, should rise and bring the earth again beneath his sway. Someday he would call when the stars were ready and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. So you get this basic grammar, this basic vocabulary of fear and loathing of this deep, dark um, secret that approaches people from, their, uh, from the inside, from their dreams, and then is, is coming up in these weird cults. 
And so you can s see how any horror writer could have a field day with these, uh, with, with, with these things. I mean, you just have to use a little creativity. You know, they were talking about X-Files earlier. There's only so many plots you can make out of horror, right? There's a monster, there's some deep, dark, sinister conspiracy. I mean, there's like six, I think. Borges, I think, uh, delineated. There's not that many. That's why a series can't go on that long, right? Because there's only so many you can do. You have to recycle them. A, a monster again, a deep, dark conspiracy again. Uh, how many times can we do this? But he establishes this whole wonderful, I don't know about wonderful is quite the word, but this whole kind of bizarre, uh, dark, uh, dark thing called the Cthulhu mythos, which has proven very profitable for people uh, to develop other horror stories. And in conclusion, I'll just read some of the titles from his works because it gives you a, a fair sense. He's into reanimators. Uh, he has uh, short stories on that. He was quite prolific. Um, the music of Eric Zahn. It's this weird music uh, that uh, they find and recreate. It's a, a very bizarre uh, music with, with a strange intent. The Lurking Fear, The Rats in the Wall, The Shunned House, The Horror at Red Hook, The Call of Cthulhu, The Color Out of Space. I'll, I'll just talk about that one. This, this meteor comes down and hits, and uh, there's this, this explosion of color. And suddenly everything starts growing abundantly and then too abundantly. And then it starts taking over the whole area and making everyone go insane. And the animals are bucking and uh, uh, dying. Pe uh, they wind up throwing people down wells. It gets, it's quite a party. Um, and it goes on. The Whisperer in Darkness at the Mountains of Madness. They're in Antarctica and there's these huge mountain ranges and they find some great city out there. And then the Shadow over Innsmouth is the one I'll conclude with. This is where strange fish people live. And they have kind of bug-eyed, they look like fish. And no one goes there because it smells like fish and all the people look like fish. And, um, and so this guy gets stuck there and with all these fishy people, they're all like eating. And, and then they have this great kind of strange fishy orgy out on this reef. And it drives the guy insane seeing them out there and then he, he f flees uh, the, this place, the Innsmouth, where all the people worship Dagon, the fish god, and uh, are all looking pretty weird. <laughs> I'm doing it total injustice. Uh, it really uh, is very gripping stuff like any good horror is. And uh, with that, I will I actually take, in, take some questions. I, I was uh, ill recently, and so I just read like all of Stephen King and got kind of addicted to it, and then I read everything in sight about horror. So I just kind of put my tea bag in horror. <laughs> Questions? Awesome. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry we are running a little over right now. Um, we do have one last presenter. So if you could, uh, after hearing about how chaotic we are as humans and how we're all dying and everything else, we get to jump into the realm of zombies and the undead. Please put your hands together for Professor Megan Gray, please. <laughs> You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. As my students are here, several of my students are here, they know it is impossible for me to stand still when I lecture. So I gotta move around. So I know zombies are kind of a popular thing these days, so I thought I'd give a little talk. I am a biologist, so you might think I'm gonna take a little bit of the fun out of zombies, because I'm gonna talk about the biology of zombies today. I'll give you a little brief history of zombies. The actual term is a, is a West African term um, from zambe, which means spirit of the dead or soul or God. So that's where it originally came from. And there was a lot of slavery trade between West Africa and Haiti. Um, so this really kind of infiltrated Haitian folklore for a long time. In fact, the voodoo religion. And so there was a thought that you died two ways. You died either naturally, like of a sickness or of old age, or you died an unnatural death. So for example, you were murdered. And so if people died an unnatural death, there was a thought that once they were buried underground, a spirit called a boker could bring them up, reanimate them, and unfortunately put them into slavery. So this was some kind of the first thoughts about what zombies were. Um, and of course, these people were generally buried alive, um, or at least there's thoughts about that in Haitian folklore that some people were buried alive and brought back into slavery, reanimated somehow. 
Um, the first kind of Western work that even talked about um, this notion of being reanimated was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and this was in 1819. Now, I know she never used the term zombie, but this was the first idea of kind of bringing back people to life, right? Reanimating them. This guy, William Seabrook, was an interesting fella. He was probably, he is, is credited for bringing the term zombie to Western culture. This book was written in 1929. He traveled around the world to Africa, to Haiti. He even indulged in cannibalism um, and said that humans taste like veal. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of interesting. Um, but he wrote this book, The Magic Island, and it was all about Haitian and voodoo folklore and zombies. So that was kind of the first introduction of the term zombie and noticing what zombies are in Western culture. And I, I think we can agree it has kind of exploded since then. Um, I, am a, I am a fan of, anybody watch The Walking Dead? Yes, lots of fans of The Walking Dead, right? Lots of movies. In fact, there's even a zombie Pikachu. Who knew, right? I, when I found that, I thought that was actually pretty cute. That's like the cutest zombie ever, right? Um, so we really like zombies, you guys. We're really fascinated as a culture with zombies. So I thought, well, why? Why are we so fascinated with zombies? So a lot of psychologists say, well, it kind of plays into our fear. If you think about it, zombies oftentimes are kind of mindless drones, kind of loss of free will, which is a big fear of a lot of humans, right? We think that's what makes us special oftentimes, makes us different than other animals, this idea of free will. And so to become enslaved, to lose that, is a big fear of ours. Obviously, there's a fear of mortality that all of us have, so that plays into that. Um, and recently, right, we really have this big fear. I mean, there's TV shows about the preppers, right, and apocalyptic destruction and plague-like sickness, right? So we tend to think about these things a lot, and we're fascinated with them. I guess I'd like to kind of look at it as we're fascinated them by them because of wishes, too, right? Think of being reborn, starting fresh. I mean, you're a zombie, but you get to start fresh, get to start new, right? There's something to that. Okay, so as a biologist, I thought I'd go over the anatomy of a zombie, okay? So what makes a zombie a zombie? Well, first, they generally are mindless, and when I say that, they don't have a lot of higher cognitive function. They're kind of drones. They just kind of go along, most zombies. Um, they have a hunger for humans, right? Flesh, and in particular, brains, right? They really like to eat brains. Um, really bad posture. I've never seen a zombie with good posture, you guys. It just doesn't exist, okay? But in fairness to zombies, right, um, they're decaying in front of us, so it's pretty hard to have good posture with that. Um, generally aggressive behavior, right? They, they kind of want to bring you into their world. They're not always fast, but they tend to be aggressive. Uh, decaying flesh and, and sores, which again, in, in their defense, they, they're the undead, right? They're decaying. Um, language deficit, <laughs> right? So I, I guess we don't tend to think of this, but they kind of just moan, right? That's about all they do. They can't have language. They don't speak like us. Um, they are reanimated or undead, and most folklore talks about this. Somehow they are brought back to life, um, and they have kind of a slow and hobbled gait. So if those, for those of you that don't know me, I don't normally look like this, but I got attacked this morning, so that's why I look this way. And I'm starting to feel a little sluggish, a little slow, so forgive me. All right, so I'm going to teach you how to become a zombie, or I guess a better way of putting it is, how do we get these disorders in humans from a realistic perspective? So maybe this is where I take the fun out of being a zombie a little bit. Okay, so number one, what's a, what's a sickness we tend to see? Well, for a long time, people thought there were two ways to become a zombie. You die and you come back, or you get infected with some sort of virus or some sort of bacteria. So first one is the chemical hypothesis. We give you a combination of drugs, we put you underground, you're kind of suspended in animation, okay? And then you are followed by a reawakening. And when you are woken up, you are usually psychotic. You're not too happy at this point. Um, and you're also kind of mindless. And again, we think this is where kind of zombies at graveyards kind of originated, this idea that they were woken up, dug up from their graves. Um, and they've been seen around a lot of graveyards. Uh, with reduced mental capabilities. This guy, Clarius Narcisse, he is a famous Haitian that was believed to be buried alive. He was given a combination of drugs, thought he was dead, buried alive, then brought back by a boker and put into slavery for the rest of his life. When these claims were actually investigated, it doesn't appear that there was a lot of truth to the story, but if you actually Google that, there's a lot of stories, a lot of folklore around this man. 
So are there drugs that can do this? Well, yes. Uh, tetrodotoxin is one of those drugs. It is a drug found in the liver and sex organs of a lot of fish, including this guy, the puffer fish. Um, it interferes with your neuron functioning, so the cells that make you walk and talk and breathe and do all the things that you do. It does cause paralysis, numbness and tingling, and kind of a general weakness or malaise. Uh, you start to have difficulty breathing. And what's really interesting about this toxin is that it can actually make your heart go down so much, so your heart rate slows down so much that people think you're dead, even though you're not. And your blood pressure can go down so much. Um, the problem is it can generally cause coma, seizures, and then death, right? But before that, you're kind of in this kind of um, unanimated state. Another drug, Tatura, we call it gypsum weed in this country. You give that to someone, it's very poisonous, creates a lot of hallucinations. When people are on this uh, drug, they, a lot of people describe it as even when you're awake, you feel like you're dreaming because you just see all kinds of weird stuff on this drug. Really intense thirst from this, uncoordinated movement. Think of zombies, right? They're not the most coordinated. Uh, rapid and weakened heart rate or beat, and then again, coma and death. You're gonna see coma and death a lot, unfortunately, today, all right? So those are drugs that, yes, we have found in voodoo kind of tradition of putting people under, but most of the time they die, they don't come back, okay? So what about viruses? Are there actual real things that happen or diseases that happen in humans? Well, African sleeping sickness is one of them. My students should know what this is. We've talked about it this week. Um, it is actually transmitted by the tsetse fly. It's trypanosoma. It's this little kind of squiggly purple thing right here. It's actually a protist that causes the disorder. Um, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it gives you fever and headaches. Skin lesions sound familiar. It's kind of zombie-like, right? Mental deterioration, irritability, and speech disorders. In fact, a lot of people say, this disease is probably the closest thing we have to turning people into zombies. The problem is, though, again, coma and death ensues, OK? So <laughs> it's not the best one, all right? So I'm going to give you another disorder, leprosy. I bet we've all heard of this disorder. It's almost been completely eradicated from the world as we speak. Most countries do not have any more cases of leprosy. Um, it's caused by an actual bacterium. Two to 10 years before you see symptoms after infection usually. But again, it actually impacts the skin and peripheral nerves. So you get sensory loss. Leprosy is an interesting thing. We tend to think of it as body parts falling off. But really, it's because you can't feel pain anymore. So if you can't feel pain anymore, you tend to do things that cause a lot of problems with your skin or cause a lot of bodily damage. Okay, Muscle weakness, numbness, um, and skin lesions occur. Now, this was a fun fact that I did not know. The armadillo, you guys, can give you leprosy. They are carriers. I did not know that. So just watch out for those armadillos. They look kind of cute. And, and well, I guess, right? I'm a biologist. They look cute. OK? Can they be rinsed? <laughs> no, they can't be. Um, although it's been completely eradicated from this country. So I think you guys are probably OK. <laughs> Um, through, uh, through mucous membranes, basically, through, yeah, that's right. Yes, don't let an armadillo sneeze on you. Great take-home message. <laughs> yes, okay. All right, my last disorder, and if I gave this talk last year, but I did it with um, werewolves. Rabies is just one of those diseases that causes everything, right? So rabies, caused by a virus this time, transmitted by bites. Zombies like to bite, yes. OK, initial symptoms, yeah, you know, fever, vomiting, but then a little anxiety, agitation, sleeping problems. And once you become rabid, we see very aggressive behavior, biting, thrashing, excessive salivation. I mean, this is very zombie-like, yes. Uh, hallucinations, fear of light and water. But again, guess how this is going to end? Coma and death, you guys are good. <laughs> All right, so unfortunately, you guys, there's not any one disorder that we think is going to cause zombieism in humans. But I do want to talk about one disorder in ants. So some of you, yes, yeah, some of you guys have heard about this. Um, so ants, this is a carpenter ant right here. They get infected with a fungus. So I've talked about bacteria, viruses, funguses, uh, fungi, excuse me. So it infects a fungus and it invades their central nervous system. And this is the weirdest thing. It causes them to actually crawl up a tree at a very specific point. They clamp down on a leaf and they die. 
And so think about it. They're kind of mindless drones crawling up a tree, biting something, and then they die. This is not a part of the ant. This is the actual fungus growing out of their head. So the fungus uses the decaying body to grow. Um, and so it's kind of gross, but once the, once the fungus gets ready to release its spores, there's said to be like a one meter death zone for ants once they release those spores. Um, this is so bad in ants, you guys, that other healthy ants can detect an infection and they will take an infected ant and literally pick them up and get rid of them and push them out of the colony, right? Just like Walking Dead, just with ants. Okay. So, but this is probably the closest thing we have to zombieism. So again, the reality of a zombie apocalypse, meh, it's probably not going to happen in our lifetime. But I wanted to tell you, all of these images are from the CDC's website, the Centers for Disease Control. They actually have this up there. They put it up there as a joke, and people loved it so much that they actually put preparedness of pamphlets together, videos, all kinds of really cool stuff. But, you know, I hate to break it to you. It's mostly like, save your food, save some water. It's stuff like that. There's not a lot of good zombie tips, okay? So every time I teach a class in biology or a course, I, I always like to leave my students with some practical advice or at least relate it back to their lives. So today I'm going to leave you with this. How do you avoid becoming a zombie? Step number one, do not eat sushi with puffer fish in it. Avoid that, okay? Step two, avoid armadillos, okay? Yes, we already discussed that, good, okay? Um, number three, don't become an ant, okay? Just don't do that, don't do that. Um, swat any tsetse flies that are around you, and by the way, they're only in Africa, so it's okay. But if you're there in Africa, swat those flies, okay? Um, avoid dog bites, which I think is generally a really good piece of advice, right? <laughs> um, and geez, stand up straight. At least, if you're going to be a zombie, at least have a zombie with good posture. Come on, you can do it. All right, and lastly, because this is a shameless plug, if you really want to understand the science about all of this, take a biology class. <laughs> all right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>